Okay. So this is Stefan, and Walter is here sitting next to me in my billiards room, former billiards room. There's no billiards table anymore. My wife took it out. There's just a bunch of gray uh, wallpaper. And uh, Walter's been here for a while in Houston. How do you like our fair city? Oh, it's a wonderful city. I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad to be on your podcast. If we uh, form a new state, I will do what I can to get you welcomed here. Oh, you're very kind. Thank you. (laughs) So Walter and I have been buddies for a while, been hashing out issues in paper and in person at Mises events, et cetera, for quite a while. Yes. And uh, we've talked this weekend, we've been together three nights now, about a lot of things. Um, retribution. Cabbages and kings. Bitcoin a little bit. A little bit, yeah. We didn't get the fractional reserve banking, but... IP. IP. Well, we, there's not much to talk about there. We agree on that too much. Yeah. Okay, so on the issue of voluntary slavery. Yes. Which we've talked about before. Yes. A little bit. And Spartan print. Yes. So what I thought I would do is try to summarize my take on your take on it, and you tell me where I'm wrong or where we disagree. Sounds good. All right. Uh, Or my take on our common Rothbardian influence or whatever. And the one problem I have with your analysis is that you rely upon type of analysis Rothbard makes as well in his um, uh, ethics of liberty, like where he talks about debtors, prison, etc. And the assumption that I have a problem with is the assumption that if you own something, it means you can make a contract about it, or you can sell it, put it that way. right? And so you always give these uh, hypotheticals about you know the guy who has little money, he needs a million bucks to save his kid, and uh, so he wants to enter into a voluntary slavery contract, which is outlandish, right? Because this is probably un- unlikely, but let's just assume it. Um, and so you're saying that if we don't allow these contracts, he won't be able to do the deal, right? But my question is, um, what is the thing that's stolen? And I, th- I see this ambiguity in the Rothbardian issue of debtor's prison as well. So let's take a typical contract of a debt like you're talking about. So someone loans a million bucks to A on a given day, right? And they're supposed to do something in exchange for it. Be a slave, repay it in a year with 10% interest or whatever, right? Yeah. So the argument is that if you do not comply with the terms of the agreement, then you're a thief. In effect, yes. So the question is, what has been stolen? Is it the original sum of money, or is it something in the future when the performance that was promised is not given? Well, I think it's something in the future when the performance that was promised isn't given because that's what the contract specifies that you should give. But are we or are we not getting off the issue of voluntary slavery by talking about debtor's prison, or do you see it as the same issue? I think. Well, I think they're related. and They're not the same issue, but they're related. Okay, we can talk about both. Let's talk about the the debtor's prison thing just for a second. Sure. Because um, Rothbard says in The Ethics of Liberty that if you do not repay a sum owed, then theoretically you are a thief and could be sent to prison because retribution is, I mean, uh, you know, punishment is deserved in the case of uh, an act of theft. And, but then he tries to sort of get out of that result by saying that it would be disproportionate. So he uses his proportionality theory to say it's too extreme of a punishment. But in theory, debtor's prison is justified. I borrow 100 bucks from you. I promise to repay 110 in a yes. year at 10% interest. And comes the year, and I don't have the money. Yes. I stole 110 from you, I okay. claim. So you're saying it's 110 that's stolen, not the original 100. Right. 
So you would agree that the original 100 that is loaned is given over to the borrower, yeah. basically 100% title. In other words, he has complete ownership of that money at that time. Yeah, I borrowed it. I, I, I can do with it as I please. You have to be able to in order to spend it. That's the right. purpose of a loan is right. that you can borrow the money. Right. So if there's a theft, it's a theft of the money that's not repaid. Right, yes. But if, if, the, if the borrower is penniless at the time of the repayment date, he doesn't have $110. Right. So what $110 is actually stolen? Where is it? Well, I don't know where it is. But it doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> it's, exist. It's been dissipated. Well, it doesn't exist. But we... Well, no, the 100 was dissipated. The 100 has been dissipated. And then he did not make a profit. Right. He lost it all. He, yes. Uh, let's say gambled on the horses. So there never was a 110 that he owned or has the, right. that the creditor has a claim to. Right. But that's what you have a right to. Well... And I owe you 110, and now you can take it out of me in... Um, Hard labor or a pound of flesh or whatever the deal is, but I owe you 110. The year is up now. And, uh, well, but you're conflating owing with property. So, I mean, Rothbard, even in his contract theory, says that the original theory of contract, which is a promise based, that you have to pay what you promise, was off base, and that it's all about transfer of title to property. Right. So, if you view a the way I view a debt contract, based upon Rothbard and Evers, and the way Evers, re, you know, elaborated on it, is that in a debt contract, the creditor gives one hundred dollars to the borrower on day one, and he gives it outright with no conditions whatsoever. But well, there's one condition. The condition is that there's another exchange, which is a future a future title transfer, one hundred ten in the year. But we all know, both sides know that the, the future is uncertain, that that transfer might not happen, the creditor, the debtor might not even be alive, and he might not have the money. So basically there's an exchange of a title transfer to a future uncertain hope, we might call it, or possible, possible thing. Expectation maybe. Whatever. Yeah. Um, in exchange for a title transfer to $100 now, present good. Right. Right. Now, if on the future one-year anniversary date there is no $110, I don't see what the debtor is stealing. I don't understand what property of the creditor, creditor that the debtor is actually stealing. Well, he made a contract to give him 110 He doesn't have the 110 so he's stealing 110 because the, the uh, creditor – owns a promissory note, say, and and it's not being made good. So if you don't want to call it stealing, you have to... No, uh, I don't. And see I the, would say call it uh, quasi-stealing or like stealing or something like that. Yeah, but the problem is you're, you're calling it stealing to justify the debtor's prison or the consequence or the, or the calling it of a contract, and yet in your argument right now, now you're... It seems circular to me because you're... You're saying, well, he made a contract or he promised to do it. So to me, one's got to be primary, and we have to do one or the other. Well, Murray does come out against promises. Like if I promise to sing at your wedding or right. something, uh, it's I'm not liable to. But this is more than a promise. This was uh, a contract. Yes. Now, I, I'm not a contract fetishist. I don't say that all contracts must be upheld. For example... Hans, me, and Guido have this uh, attack on fractional reserve banking, even though it's contractual. Uh, we, we don't go along with contracts there. Certainly a contract uh, to commit murder against an innocent person. You know, I hire you to kill some innocent person. Right. That's not a valid contract. Another invalid contract would be you agree to sell me a square circle, or a, which can't exist, or a pink elephant, or a, a unicorn, which conceivably could exist but doesn't exist. All those contracts are invalid, so I'm not a contract fetishist. Yeah, but what, what does it mean for a contract to be invalid? When you say it's invalid, what does that mean? Null and void? I mean, it's silly. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll sell you a square circle for $10? I mean... It means it can't be enforced. It, it can't be enforced? The whole thing is sort of nugatory because it's silly. It, but the whole point of contract is we have a property owner that we recognize as in control of legal ownership of a scarce resource, right. which means he has the power to dispose of it. 
Right. He has the power to, by his a manifestation of his assent or his consent, right, communicated by some language or something that everyone recognizes, to assign title to someone else, right. either partially or incompletely. Right. If it's completely, then it's a sale. If it's partially, then there's a co-ownership situation or a rental or a lease or something like that, right? right? Yeah. So let's imagine that um, I have a box, a cardboard box that's worth virtually nothing. And I tell you that inside this box, there is either a diamond or there's, there's not a diamond. There's a maybe diamond. But there's a X percent chance of there being a diamond in the box. And I say... Walter, if you will give me $10 now, I will give you this box. And you will own the box and whatever's inside the box. Now, you would recognize that as a valid contract, I would assume. Yes. So you're buying a, an uncertain uh, pig thing. A, pig in a poke. A pig in a poke. So you open the box. There's a diamond. You're rich. There's not a diamond. You lost out. It's a gamble, basically, right? Yeah. Now, I view that as the way the future necessarily always is that if you ever have a, a claim to a future good that you're buying an uncertain thing a hope of something existing but if the thing doesn't occur or doesn't exist there's not an act of theft actually so this is my problem with this debtor's prison thing um i just don't see how someone who is unable to repay a debt is a criminal or a thief unless you adopt the, the theory of contract Rothbard repudiated, which is the promise theory. Well, I don't uh, adopt the promise theory. I agree with you and Murray that, that the promise theory is invalid, but I think this is more than a promise because there's been an exchange of titles. Uh, I do want to uh, articulate that I don't believe that there's any such thing, technically speaking, as a future good. There, right now, there are no future goods. There's the expectation of a good in the future, but that's okay. Just the, no, no, I I, I like that. I agree the, with that. But um, so is our problem the 110? Suppose I uh, forgot about the 110 just for the moment, just for well. Suppose we forget, suppose we forget about the exchange. Let's just make it a one way exchange. Let's say that you give to me your beloved libertarian acolyte. You say, Stefan. In one year, I will give you $110, just if you're alive. Not forgive, it's not an exchange. It's just a unilateral but conditional gift. Now, let's say in one year you don't have the $110. Well, I agree with Murray, and I think you, about promises. If I just promise you something and I don't uh, fulfill the promise, I'm not a criminal. I'm a, I'm a bad guy. I'm a... Rotten kid, but... Well, you know. I'm not talking about a promise. I'm talking about a title transfer. I mean, are, are you are you saying that Murray's title transfer idea only works if there's an exchange, like two, two, uh, two directional transfers? Oh, I see what you're saying. Now, look, if I give you this wristwatch right now yes. as a gift, yes. uh, and now I say, I change my mind, give it back to me, you can say, no backsies, as kids would or, say. Or what if you give me the watch now and you say, Stefan, I'm going to give you this watch as a gift right. right now. Here it is. And then I say, fine, but I'm going to let you use it for a year. I'm going to lease it back to you. Or you say, Stefan, I'll give you this watch for a year, but you can't get it until a year from now. I see no difference in those two different oh, I, arrangements. I agree. I agree. But the point is there's a distinction between possession and ownership. Right. That is right. So I, I would say if I give you the gift, even either now or I give it to you as of a year from now. Yes, and I don't come through in a year. I stole your watch. Yes, either but, way. But but let's so let's say that you give me the watch now as of a year from now. In other words, you dated. You say that Stefan, I think I'm, you know, I'm not going to need this watch in a few months. No, I, but I, I want it for a few months, but I'm going to go in and give it to you now. So in one year, the ownership will be yours. I'm giving you this watch now, but and I say, Stefan, is it okay if I borrow it for a year? And yes. you say yes. Whatever. And now a year comes, and I don't return your watch No, no, you. no. If you don't return it to me, I would agree that's theft. Ah, okay. We agree on that. But if the watch doesn't exist in a year, did you steal it from me? Let's say the day before the due date, the watch evaporates. 
or lightning. Or someone hits steals you. it or whatever. I owe you a watch. It's your watch. Well, but I owe gave it, it to oh, you. But, but <laughs> and if you I don't say have... you gave it to me, what what is the it? Well, I would say that if a year comes and either the watch evaporates or it gets crushed or something, I owe you, uh, let's say, 100 bucks. Why? Which would be the equivalent. Why? Because it's your watch. I borrowed it for a year, and I'm not returning it to you. I, okay. I got to give you something, but Stefan, we did say we were going to talk about voluntary slavery. I'm we're getting only, to that. I'm we're only to going that. to talk about this for a few minutes, and we've already been talking You're right. about this. You're right. So let's talk about voluntary slavery. Okay. Unless you want to do more on this. Uh, no, 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 no. It's no, your no. show. So that's fine. It's <laughs> okay. my show. My okay. show. Um, okay. And maybe this was preliminary and pointless, but you know, it was fun. Well, it was fun. Yeah. So. Whatever. Um, okay. So in voluntary slavery. And I see connections to what we've been talking about. But the, the problem I have with voluntary slavery is that there is an assumption by people that ownership of an object implies the right to alienate the title to it. And so people like you who are being consistent, you just make an analogy or you make – you know. You, you say that you know, just like I can sell my uh, my car or my watch, I can sell my body because I own them all, and that's very simple. And it, you know, the, I mean, it's simple in a good way. It's like it's pure. You're saying, listen, the reasoning is the same. Occam's razor is simple. Yeah, so that doesn't mean simple minded. No, I'm not. Simple. Not I'm not saying simple minded. No, right. The the, pro- the problem I have with it is that it it is the the original assumption is that. Ownership implies the ability to sell. Now, the reason I think that you say that and others say that is because they're so used to objects of commerce that we sell being things that we own that they assume that the ability to sell is a natural aspect of ownership, right? Yes. Now, when I think from fundamentals and I think what's the root of ownership of bodies or ourselves, as some people say… Self ownership or body ownership, and the ownership of things that we we use that are not part of our bodies. I see them as distinct, and I see the Lockean idea is the root of ownership of external objects, but not our bodies. The Lockean idea is that we own ourselves, which I think is a vague statement. I think self is sort of misleading and subject to equivocation. I prefer to talk about. Scarce resources like our body. So the question to me is only who owns my body. Myself, you, we can disagree on what self means. Does it mean your soul, your memories, your hopes, your dreams, your extensions of yourself, whatever? The only real dispute is who owns your body. Some slave owner or a, com, a communitarian group or yourself or the person who inhabits the body or controls it. Whether you're religious or not, you don't need to go into that. The question is, which person has the right to control that body? And the answer that we give, we libertarians give, you and I give, is that the the original person is the initial owner, not the, the only owner. The inhabitor of the body. But not – but only initially. Yeah. You can lose that right by committing crime, let's say. Absolutely. And you think you can lose it by uttering certain words, certain magical incantations that – Transfer the ownership to someone else. Yes. Right? I Not to it. disparage it, but no, you know, no, no, yeah, no. I, you, I, th- I accept that as an I accurate, would say uh, you can trans you can lose the ownership of your body by committing an action of aggression because I'm a libertarian. And yeah. I believe that every person has the right to control his body, uh, but you don't have the right to commit aggression, which implies that you have the right to use force to stop aggression or in res- some somehow in response to aggression. Defense. Right. Sure. You can also use someone else's body if they consent to it. Absolutely. So there, to my mind as a libertarian, there's only two ways that you have the right to use someone else's body. Number one, if they consent to it. Number two, if they've committed an act of aggression that justifies treating them like… An object. An object. Right. Like you partially or completely own them, either during an act of self-defense… Or after, if you believe in retribution, whatever. But the point is that's the only two ways. And my idea is that 
if I just promise to you or say to you, I will be your slave or whatever, that action, number one, is not an act of aggression. Okay? So then the only way that the, the, the master is entitled to use force against the purported slave later, if he changes his mind and tries to run away, which he would have to have the right to use force against him if he's going to be a legitimate slave owner, is if the guy's consented. Now, it seems to me our difference is that you think he did consent because he said so earlier. And I say he didn't consent because he said no now. Later. And to me, you would have to say that an earlier statement of assent overrides a later one. Whereas to my mind, it's always the most recent one that matters because, for example, let's say you say, you know, let's get in the ring and box. Do you agree? Yes. We get in the ring. We're kind of staring each other down. You put your gloves on. You're looking kind of tough. Walter's a lot more buff than I thought he was. <laughs> I start having second thoughts and I go, on second thought, I don't want to box Walter. <laughs> now, if you punch me in the jaw anyway, in that situation, wouldn't you agree that you have committed aggression? Absolutely. And it's because I didn't consent, right? Well, let me give my side of okay, it Okay, go ahead. Uh, but I first want to preface it for because not everyone listening will be a libertarian. Okay. And I want to say that voluntary slavery has nothing to do with the kind of slavery that existed in the United States before 1865 or 1861. That was coercive slavery, and we're not discussing that. We, you, we, 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 we both disagree with uh, antebellum slavery. Right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> we, finally we, something we yeah, can agree we, on. We agree on that. Well, we agree on many, many That's things. That's true. I know. But, I'm but on this issue, we uh, <laughs> bitterly and utterly oppose that as a, a – pretty much a paradigm case of the violation of uh, libertarian rights. Yeah, and probably almost every form of slavery in history that's ever existed. Yes, certainly. Okay, so with that, that, with that out of the way... And, well, and by the way, as an aside, what about people joining the U.S. military now and they cannot quit, right? They enlist. I would say they're sort of coerced into it because of unemployment or... Um, uh, inflation or uh, 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 minimum wage laws, and the U.S. government is an illegitimate slave owner in the first place. What's that called? A performative uh, 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 contract that where uh, I there's a word I'm missing where I, I can force you to live up to your contract, even though specific you're, performance. That's it. Specific performance yeah. contract. That's yeah. what we're yeah. discussing. Yeah. Well, in my view, uh, specific performance contracts are justified. And with regard to your boxing analogy, before I get into my own little okay. stick, mm -hmm. uh, in the boxing um, uh, mores, mm -hmm. if you put your knee on the canvas, mm -hmm. I'm not allowed to punch you. And I'm not allowed to punch you under the belt. I can only punch you over the belt or uh, above the belt. You mean just during the regular match? In an, in an ordinary boxing match, mm -hmm. if I punch you below the belt, I'm committing a foul. Yeah, and, so, you know, so in other words, no one's consented to being punched no one, under the belt. No one and is so consented. that if you punch him under the belt, you're doing something that is known to be unconsented to. Right. Which and, is aggression. And, yeah, and now if it's an if it's intentional, if it's an yeah. accident, yeah. you know it happens. But if yeah. it's intentional, you can lose the match right then and there. Right. And also, if I knock you down, and you're lying on the ground, right. or just your knee is on the ground, right. I can no longer punch you. Right. Even though above the belt. So if you don't want to consent anymore, and let's say I look buffer than you thought I would look, yep. All you have to do is get down on one knee, and now it's illegitimate for me to punch you. Gotcha. So I think that the boxing analogy isn't. I mean, it's a good a good first start, but it doesn't carry okay. through. Okay. Okay. So go ahead with so your. Go ahead. Now let me give my. Uh, two minutes on this. Mm -hmm. The example I use is I have a child who has got a dread disease and it'll cost a million dollars to cure him. And um, you, Stefan, have long wanted me to be your slave and you could order me around. Which is actually true. Yes, because you're a vicious kind of yeah. guy, but very rich. And you'd be a good slave. Yes, I would obey and, yeah. you know. And uh, what what I the deal is, you give me a million dollars and I give it to my son's doctors and they cure him. 
and uh, we each gain because I value his life more than my freedom. You value my servitude more than the million dollars, so we each gain. Now, if we don't allow uh, voluntary slave contracts to be enforced, then you'll not give me the million dollars because you know that as soon as I change my mind later on after you give me my first order, I say, hey, wait, I don't like you anymore. Uh, you're not going to give me the million dollars and my son will die and we'll both be out of a mutually beneficial contract. So that's my motivation for supporting voluntary slavery. And uh, the, the thing about consenting, you see, uh, we, I think that our preliminary discussion is relevant, as, know, as you said, because it's not just a promise. You gave me a million dollars. There was a contract. There was a, a collateral. I forget what Murray calls it. Um, there's some word I'm missing again. Maybe collateral is good, but uh, you gave me some physical thing, a million dollars. And now if I – Like dis- a performance bond. A, well, no, not a performance bond because a, a bond can be overcome. Uh you gave me a million bucks, and if I run away with myself, namely if I disobey you, I am stealing a very valuable piece of your property, even maybe more valuable than a horse or a dog or maybe even more valuable than a house. I'm stealing your property, namely me. So the question is, if if I disobey you and uh, the contract says that you can whip me if I disobey, and I disobey and you start whipping me and I yell to the police, hey, he, uh, Stefan is uh, whipping me, he's committing assault and battery, you've got a very good defense. You can say, wait, I own Walter. I bought him fair and square. There's a contract and there's a signature. And uh, I'm not committing uh, assault and battery on Walter because um, uh, he's my property. And, you see, Murray says, well, you can't buy my will. And my answer to that is will schmill. I don't care about will. You only own my body. You don't own my thoughts. I mean, you know, you you can't own people's thoughts. Yeah. Um, But you own the right to whip me if I disobey you. And let's say the contract specifies that. So you're an innocent person when you whip me for disobedience. And you have to say, no, you're guilty because you're committing assault and battery because I changed my mind. And I think it's too late. There are no backsies. I already sold you myself for a million bucks, and I don't have the million bucks. You mean your body, not yourself. uh, Sorry, uh, I stand corrected. My body. And I'm I'm being precise not to be petty fogging, but because – I mean – so I appreciate that. uh, So there's – there's a – say I see three problems with this. Number one, you're you're saying that I sold myself to justify – My body. My body. I, or your body. Sorry. I misspoke. Sorry, I, was, I misspoke. You, now you misspoke. Yeah. It's catching. <laughs> uh, you, saying you sold your body as an argument to justify the ability to sell your body. So I see that as a little bit of circular argument. In other words, this is what we're disputing, whether or not you have the ability to utter words that transfer title to your to your body. And you're just saying, well, I sold my body, so therefore it's justified to use force against someone's body as if you own them. But that's to me, seems question-begging. There was this very famous case of Ludwig Wittgenstein and Norman Malcolm, two very famous philosophers. Okay. Norman Malcolm was the student of Ludwig Wittgenstein, and they were walking down the street, and Ludwig Wittgenstein said to Norman Malcolm, I will give you these trees that we now right. pass right. on two conditions. One, you don't do anything with the trees, and two, you don't try to prevent the previous <laughs> owners from doing anything with the trees. And what he was trying to tell Norman Malcolm was, look... If you can't sell it, you don't own it. And if you can't prohibit other people from doing stuff with it, you don't own it. Just because I give you these trees or sell them to yeah. you doesn't mean you own it. Uh, these two things are crucial. Yeah. And I say now that if I really own myself, I have a right to sell it. Myself. I know. and uh, this Not is... myself, my body. I keep slipping. Right. If I really own my body, I have a right to sell it. If I don't have a right to sell it, I don't own it. Well, it reminds me – I. Um... Of these registries that sell you stars, you've seen this. You can no. name you can name a star after yourself. Oh yeah. There's yeah. private registries, so ah, you pay them okay. twenty bucks, and right. they'll send you a kit, and they name. I mean, there's billions of stars. So they just pick one. And they they put Walter Block Jr. on it, or whatever. Right. <laughs> now it's just star. in their little private registry, yes. but you've bought the name, right to name stars. Fair I don't square. know what that gives you. I had another friend who lived in China. He was a medical student, yeah. like twenty years ago, and he says. Yeah, when I was there, I, I bought a house, and I still own it. I said, what do you mean you still own it? He never goes there. He goes, well, you know, there's a house that I bought when I lived there. I said, well, is it just empty? He said, no, a family lives in it. I said, who? He said, whoever the government said to live in it. 
I said, well, so in what sense do you own the house? Did they pay you rent? What? He's, nothing. I said, he says, well, if I travel to China someday, they will probably let me stay there for free one night or something. I said, <laughs> well, so you basically don't own it at all. Right. So I understand what you're saying. Right. But um, – um, and I, I kind of agree with your point about this will issue. I think Rothbard, when he says that the reason he disagrees with voluntary slavery is that the will can never be alienated. I agree with you that you don't need the will to be alienated to own someone. Just the bond. Just like you don't need a dog's will to be alienated to be the owner of a dog. By its nature as an animal, or, you know, a moving spirit, it has its own will. You need the legal right to compel it to do what you want it to do. Precisely. That's what slavery is. So I don't agree with that. But the more I thought about it, I think Rothbard was getting at something that I actually agree with, which I think is – this distinction of the sources of ownership, which is that the the basis of ownership of the human body is distinct from and more primary than the ownership of external objects that we homestead. And the basis of ownership in the human body, which is what Hoppe points out, is basically who has the closest connection to or link, the best claim to the resource. And in the case of the human body… It just happens to be the natural connection, which Rothbard points out as natural, which is who has direct control over it. Now, Hoppe makes this explicit, and I think that's what Rothbard was getting at when he talked about the slave owner, the slave's will was still part of him. What he meant was even after you promise to be a slave, you are still the controller of your body, and therefore you still have the best connection to it, and therefore you're still the owner of it. Because the source of ownership of bodies is this direct control thing. Well, when I homestead a, a bit of land by putting in a corn crop yes. or I domesticate a cow, a wild yes. cow, and I domesticate it, in the first instance, I am the owner, assuming that I mix my labor with it sufficiently, Yes. Uh, of the land or of the cow. Yes. But then if I sell it to you… You're the owner, even though I yes. was the first owner. Well, I say the same thing goes with the bodies. Certainly, we all agree, me, you, Hans, and Murray agree that we are the initial owners. That's the whole point of being against coercive slavery in, yes. in the early South and in, in, or in the early U.S., North and South. But uh, here we diverge because yeah, we, so we, we agree that we're the initial owners, and I say, yes, we're the initial owners of the body that we all inhabit, each one of us. A different body, but then I say you have a right to sell it, and if you don't have a right to sell it, then you don't really control and own the body fully. But you do because ownership means the right to control. It doesn't mean the right to get rid of the right to control. Well, I guess I I, I think we're at a, a standstill here. Well, well, let me ask you this. I don't this. know what else to say. <laughs> well, let, let me ask you this. Do you believe that um, – um, uh, well – the source of the right to own things, okay, does it come from – is there only one source? In other words, are you saying that everything comes from homesteading? Because if, if, if every property right comes from homesteading, then how do children be become self-owners? Well, you see, that, that's a problem we discussed a few hours ago yep. uh, in the kitchen, yep. and I – I think that the only person who is really seriously trying to tackle that issue is you. I don't. I only give you a ninety-nine out of a hundred on that article because I, I still feel a little queasy. The the argument, if if I remember it, and you correct me if I'm wrong, is the child consists of nothing more than the sperm and the egg plus a bunch of food. Yeah. And the sperm came from the father, and the egg came from the mother. So how does the kid get to own himself? Right. And I don't know the answer to that. that but is, but this is my this is my. But you don't believe the kids are slaves of their parents. No, sir, none of us. So believe, you it, don't believe it, that either. I don't believe it. Right. So you think at some point the kid, the child gets rights. The kid gets. So rights. you either have to think there's some act of homesteading. Yes. Or you have to think there's a separate source of rights to a body, which is what I believe. No, no, I, I believe in homesteading. You know, you have yeah, but homesteading means acquiring ownership to an unowned resource. Right. The you child's know, body is not unowned. Well, you have a child. I have two children, 
And my advice to all new parents is get in as much <laughs> kissing as you can. I know. Because I know. all too soon they start thinking they own themselves. And Walter, I've taken that advice and uh, I'm, I'm doing it. Yes. I'm doing the hell out of it. My I'm, kid's nine and still <laughs> hasn't petered out yet. I'm still taking your advice. My son, whenever I try to kiss him, he says, no homosexual activity. Yeah, I know, so, I, know, I know. He's a pain in the ass, my kid. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but when they were... Well, like he's, a, what, 36? So, he's I mean, 34 now, so <laughs> okay. he's still a pain in the ass. But when, when my children, and I'm sure this is uh, true of Ethan, when they were uh, six months old, you can kiss them all you yeah. wanted, and they had no objection. Yes. But as they got older and older, they started going like this, putting their arms up and saying no. Yes. They learned the word no, and then uh, all things deteriorated when they learned the word no. But even if you say so, they, they homestead their bodies, you have to admit they're not homesteading an unowned resource. Well, they're homesteading an egg and a sperm and some food. But it's not unowned. Until they homestead it, it's already an owned thing. By who Who owns it? By the, the mother, the parents. Okay, so let's say that the parents own the kid until he's six months old. So there's a transfer of ownership. It's not like homesteading. Yes. It's more like a contract no, or something. No, not a contract. He sort of takes control of his body. Before, yes, when he's because six control months, matters. I agree. Control, this is what matters. Control is what matters. Yes, we agree on that. Control is the key, and the kid sort of gradually wakes up into self-awareness and yes. self-ownership. Yeah, I agree. And when the kid is three years old uh, – Yeah, I'm not kid, debating on the transition and how right. we draw the line. What I'm saying is at a certain point, he becomes the, con- the self-aware, sapient or sentient controller of that body. And therefore owner of that body. Yeah, he, right. but he's the owner because he's the controller, right? yes. not because he's yes. the, not because he homesteaded it. Right, but then I say, and here we diverge. I say he can sell it. You say he can't sell it. No, no, but 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 this is my point. If you recognize that the 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 rationale or the basis for ownership of a person's body is his direct control of it, right? Initially, yes. As opposed to ownership of a chair or a car or a table. Because you acquired it and it used to be unowned. Right. See, what I'm thinking is ownership means the legal right to control, which means to have the – you're the person who has the right to make the decision about who can use this resource. Yes. You, can, you can consent or not. Yes. Sex, you know, sure. boxing match, whatever. Yeah. In the case of something that you acquire that was previously unowned – because you acquired it and because its nature is ex- external from human bodies and because it used to be unowned and because it is owned only because there is a human actor who intends to own it and asserts his domination over it, his dominion over it, he can abandon that. He could release it back into the wild. He can abandon his ownership. Like committing suicide? No, I'm talking about a chair. I own oh, a chair. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm talking about the chair. Yeah, certainly. You can abandon the I chair. I say I, I owned it. Now I can unown yes, it. Sure. I unown it. Yeah, yeah. So to me, if you can own something or acquire it, you can unown it or unacquire it. But you can also unown yourself by but committing you, suicide. But that's not unowning yourself. That's no. ending yourself. Or you can unown yourself by selling yourself into slavery. Yeah, but that's… Okay, so that's, that's where we issue. disagree. Okay, let, let me raise a different point of view as we're starting to repeat ourselves. Now, I'm sure you'll agree with me on this, namely markets and used body parts, uh, uh, blood, uh, kidneys, hearts, Absolute, liver. Absolutely, of course should be legal. We have a right to alienate uh, our liver or whatever we want. The, the, the question would be whether you can be compelled to go through with an agreed-upon operation – well, let's forget about that for the moment. Okay. Uh, I mean, obviously that's... But yeah, I agree with you, of course. That should be legal. we can alienate parts of our body. Absolutely. Once you sever it from your body, right. I think that's an, an alienable owned thing. Right. So uh, what I'm trying to work you into is agreeing that if you can sell a toe and you can sell below the ankle and you can sell below the knee, you can sell below the hip. No, you can sell you can anything can... after it's severed. Why can't you sell the whole thing? Because... In one fell swoop. Because there's no one there left to agree to the transfer. I mean, I just agreed. I I agreed because I wanted to save my son's life. Yeah, but I don't. I don't think I can agree now to sell my foot and have it be enforced. That's why I said, who can be compelled to go through with it? If I choose not to go the, to go through the surgery, now I'll give you this. I think that there's some circularities in parts of your argument, but I'll give you this. The, the difficulty with my argument is this, which you haven't raised. So I'm going to 
give you I need all what I the, think is – I need all the help I can get. <laughs> Thank you. The, the hard part is this. I believe that you can alienate title to acquired objects or even future acquired objects. So let's suppose I agree that every piece of property that I ever come to own in the future is yours. You're my – you're my master. Right. Uh, now you're the slave. I'm the master. So okay. you can't beat me for running away, but you can snatch every morsel of food away from me the second I get it. Huh. Interesting. Every dime I make from any job, you can take it from me. You hmm. can garnish my wages. You can garnish my food. Interesting. So basically that would give you the ability to compel me to do what you want because if I don't listen to your orders, you can cause me to die. suffocate to death or yeah. die or whatever. Well, so – and I don't have a good argument against that except for some kind of libertarian bankruptcy type argument, which is the ability to kind of have a, a little sphere of minimal living support that you can't alienate. But that makes me uncomfortable because it's like an it's like a bankruptcy argument, right? Yeah, no, welfare for the bankrupt. So if you could compel someone to do what you want by having them alienate everything outside their bodies hmm. – then you could achieve almost the same thing as with your body. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm going to delete the last two minutes. Uh, <laughs> no, no, don't you dare. <laughs> because, you know, uh, I want to make a meta discussion now just for a minute. All right. I'll get back to this. One of the things I enjoy not only in this discussion but in every discussion I've ever had with you is that we're really not trying to beat up the other guy. There's no ego. No, we're we, really we, trying no, we're, to get we, to the yeah, truth I, with a capital T. And if you see an argument that can help me or vice versa, you will articulate it. Now, I just don't see anything that will help you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I know. Well, <laughs> but, thank you. But in truth, I'm actually not that upset by the idea of voluntary slavery contracts. It's just to me it's more academic Oh yeah. because sure. to be honest, let's say we achieve Walter Blocky in the libertarian world. Which would be ninety nine point nine percent of what I want anyway. Yeah. Sure. The only problem is people <laughs> that are so stupid <laughs> right. that they so, agree to so stupid. They want to save their son's lives. Which will never. That, yeah. You whatever. Have a son? Wouldn't yeah, you yeah, want to yeah. save his life if you were in a dread disease and I was rich and and only I could save him? No. Th that <laughs> I'm you joking. Wouldn't want to save <laughs> no, him? I'm, I'm going to tell your wife what you just said. <laughs> You're going to be in trouble, boy. <laughs> Um, no, no, seriously. Uh, if your son were had a dread disease and I had enough money to save him, if you promised to, to be my slave, yeah, I, I would, would. I would want to be able to do that, of course. But I would also want there to be an out for me to find a way to but, weasel out of it later. But, but if but, there was a way for you to weasel out of it, I couldn't it, do then, it. I know. Then, yeah, I got then it. Then the contract would fall it. apart. So if if. If yeah, you no. love your son, you have to I know. Agree with I have to agree with you. I know. And I do love my son. Okay. If I don't agree with you, I'm a bad father. Yes. And I know I'm not a bad father. You, know, so. you are a bad father if I you know. don't agree with me. <laughs> no, but my point is really, to be honest, this doesn't upset me too much because you know the worst case is we have a society where if you actually sign on the dotted line and you go through these formalities and you say – then you're a slave. It's like, well, I mean you know, I'm not too afraid of living in that society because – if you really hate that idea, then just don't sign the yeah, damn slavery right, contract. And let your son die. You're really – no one's any worse off right. by having another option on the table. Hey, I think I've made a convert of you now. I'm just telling you I work your, your world doesn't horrify me that much. It's just no, – No, it's not just that it doesn't horrify you. It's, it's that bad fatherhood is, is, yeah. is, right. is, is going to happen to you if you don't agree with me, boy. All right. Well, I think we'll call this one a draw <laughs> okay. or at best. I'm happy to call it a draw. Uh that was fun. All right, Walter. Thank you. Oh, it was. It's always a pleasure. Now let's go. Uh, let's go watch some uh, some impermissible TV. Okay, sure. <laughs> That's